Oh, well, hello. <laughs> uh, I know we've said this a million times, but uh, we really need to do a countdown. We need to do a countdown thing. Because uh, I know it's hard for people to, uh, to start logging in uh, when we do this. But uh, so we are going to do <clears throat> kind of a year in review tonight. Um, you'd think after a year and a half we'd have the kinks out, but we kind of don't yet. Um, so for anyone who hasn't been here before, or if, if you're new to Century Guild, um, we started doing these online salons as a way to kind of uh, emulate what we used to do in the physical gallery space. <clears throat> so the idea uh, is kind of like uh, either during a show when, when you're walking around and looking at art and hearing about things or at the end of a show when the gallery is a little bit quieter and, and a few of us would gather and you'd be talking about either the show or different things with symbolism or one of the new books we'd put out or something like that. So um, it's just kind of a way for us to to be present for the community. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and I will uh, do my best to answer them. Uh, and it doesn't even need to be relevant to what we're talking about. Um, anything relating to anything that we've done or Art Nouveau or symbolism or the art industry or music or film or anything, uh, I'm happy to, to just be present and help however I can. Um, so the, the, the first thing that we'll do is to get into, um, obviously we do a lot with Kickstarter. It's a platform that uh, has been very good to us and uh, an organization of people that I like immensely. Um, it's definitely a great way to bridge the gap between that fantasy that you have of wouldn't this be cool to uh, something being reality. And sometimes it's a movie and sometimes it's a big book and sometimes it's just something fun and interesting. So half of this is going to be us sharing what we did, but the other half I hope maybe inspires you that if you've had an idea that you've thought, ah, it'd be really cool to do this, um, you know, Kickstarter is an option. And even if it's not, even if it's just something that you just make one or two of and sell on Etsy or give to friends for the holidays or something, that's cool too. Um, so, uh, Chandra, if you could pull up the PDF that I have, I made a very remedial <laughs> PDF. Uh, that shows uh, kind of the year in review. And uh, the, the bar on the side there will be the T's. Um, but so the first thing that we did, the earliest thing in the year, is that this sigil was one of the symbols that Alphonse Mucha created for uh, the Le Pater series. And I just loved it just loved it I thought it was such a great piece of um, you know kind of psychedelic uh, you know obviously the the work that inspired rock poster art you know very psychedelic very um, romantic very dreamlike uh, and the idea here is um, God, I can't believe I'm drawing a blank on this. Which verse is it? Uh, Our Father Heart in Heaven. Um, you know, obviously I'm doing way too much. Uh, Chandra, what's the... Uh, I'm doing that thing where I'm not even going to try to think about it. I've just been doing too much. Uh this one correlates to, here, let me see them in order. Um, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. 
Um, and so the, the meaning there, uh, you know, I don't want to derail this into a big Lepater talk, but, you know, the, the thing is, like, I, I grew up Catholic, um, and, and, and nothing will make you an atheist faster than going to Catholic school. Uh, but I, I respect and appreciate the symbolism of Catholicism, uh, and there's certainly a lot of sentiments that are present in like the Judeo-Christian uh, ideals that I do think resonate through all kinds of mysticism, uh, but even more importantly, through the way that we're supposed to be in our community. And so the idea that there is a... Uh, the center is love, and that from that, all of this love emanates. The, these things that we are, that are part of this whole, come out. Um, and they're all, each one is an echo of that center, and it's almost just kind of like a, a fractal that just expands into eternity. And the idea that there's kind of this ethereal wind that these hearts are being carried out upon, um, you know, it's a little hippy dippy in that beautiful psychedelic t-shirt way, but I think it's so beautiful and I really, really love just that sentiment of the idea that, that our physical and mental and emotional shapes can all be different, but the heart of what a person is deserving of respect, deserving of appreciation, deser deserving of recognition, um, that these things are all infinite and uh, simultaneously unique and identical, uh, and that the shapes and forms that they, you know, that we take are all different, but that we're all the same, you know, again, it's just that idea of, of, you know, what's your, what's your community? What's your circle of friends? What's your family? What's, and the idea that it doesn't matter what country someone lives in or what religion they are or any of that, that the only real law in the universe uh, is that we really are the same and that we should be respecting and loving each other. Uh, so, um, you know, that's a lot of tangents, but I was trying to be respectful of Mooka in there. So that was the first thing that we did. Oh, and so the thing is, I just kept looking at it, and I was like, God, I want that on a T-shirt. I know we sold more Heather Blue than anything, but, you know, I wanted a lime green t-shirt with orange mooka hearts with pink trim and mustard and orange and purple. I love those. I love those palettes. Um, and then there is Miss Cat. So we, so Cat, Cat, Cat has, um, Cat has some problems. Cat uh, will just randomly start laughing from the other room. And when you go to check on her, it's that she's told herself uh, the most hilarious joke. And so one of, one of these is that uh, the, I, you know, she makes cat puns about the poster. She's been doing it for years and years and years. And... The idea that Beers de la Mers is the correct pronunciation of the Mooka poster is something she's been uh, amusing herself with for quite some time. So she had the idea of asking our very, very good friend, Doug Klauba, to start helping her. Uh, I think the word is enable. Uh, with the idea of taking these classic posters 
and making versions with uh, feline models. So you've got the Mucha, you've got, of course, Mutropolis, very, very iconic poster that Doug hilariously, uh, you know, Kat's idea was put a cat in there. And then, you know, Doug turned the cities into cat trees. And uh, there, whoops, there they are with the original in our library. Uh, and so we did this as a Kickstarter. We made uh, pins, little, little uh, enamel pins with them. And of course, you know, the idea of a cat creeping around in the dark is, as any cat owner will attest, can be, can be a terrifying sound in the middle of the night. But these are just hilarious. And uh, Doug Klauba did the paintings. Uh, it was Cat's concept. And uh, it, was, it was really nice to do a Kickstarter that I didn't do. This was, I was working on Caligula and, uh, you know, these guys were bringing, bringing mirth and joy into the world with that. So this is one, I don't have a lot to say about it, except just that it was, whoops, really fantastic. And Kat made a video where she pretended to find this poster in a wall. So if you go find the Kickstarter for this, um, Oh, there've been so many variants of cabinet of Dr. Calcari. That is one that I think she will do. Uh, I think she's kind of bracing herself and looking to get Doug to do the next batch, but it was a lot of fun. We do so much work that's very serious and, um, yeah, this was just a lot of fun. And, and like I said, it was nice for me because, uh, it was, it was something that, um, Chandra put together on the back end and then Kat and Doug, uh, worked on all the concept work and it was super fun. And then one that's not in here, we did do an absinthe robot, a, a big poster reprint. That was a Chandra project. I'm a terrible judge of what would, um, do well, uh, because I like terribly, terribly obscure, weird things. And uh, as she has accurately noted, we do better with things that are a little prettier. Uh, and it doesn't matter necessarily how obscure they are as much as, as kind of the beauty seems to be. Uh, understandably, what people are willing to hang in their homes and live with. And so then the next big thing that happened is that our, our summer was, our summer was Caligula. Uh, this is Jack. Jack, uh, many of you may recognize because Jack and I have worked together for, oh my gosh, I mean, it's a long time, well over a decade. So he would always do all the shows with us. He is also the invisible hands on all of our books. He does uh, all the image preparation and is a, I, I do the, the design for the things we do now, but a lot of when we were doing the catalogs, he used to do. Um, and he, like he did the, the logo design for Cursed Pirate Girl. So Jack is really outstanding uh, and it's very, funny to think about I mean gosh it's probably it's almost been 20 years that we've worked together and just a very beautiful thing because it started very much uh, with him as a uh, as a uh, confused creative uh, and I say that in the sense of you know just a really really good person with lots of uh, really unique and inspired ideas to offer, but I don't think he'd had uh, a garden where he could really blossom. And so when I think about it now, I couldn't possibly describe him as someone that works for me as much as someone who works with me. Um, 
his ideas are quite often things that I would say, oh, I wish I'd thought of that. Uh, so yeah, so that's been a, a wonderful relationship. And then of course, that photo uh, is then Kat, you know, same thing. She's pretty awesome. And we are, of course, here at Beyond Fest. So when I was trying to prep this stuff for tonight, I didn't have good photos of Austin. Uh, and I didn't even think to, to get photos of Can. Uh, there's photos of uh, Justin Hawkins presenting the film for us. I was laid up with COVID and didn't make it. But Dave McKean uh, was there, and Justin Hawkins did some voices in the movie. And uh, they're both really wonderful friends of mine, and uh, they were both there. So then the next premiere was Austin. That was the thing I was saying. Well, I, I didn't have any photos of that um, handy. But that was... Uh, that was quite an experience. Uh, and so the U.S. premiere, the world premiere was at Cannes, the U.S. premiere was at Austin, and then the West Coast premiere was at Beyond Fest. Um, and everything has been just infinitely better than you would hope something like this uh, could be. I think I enjoyed Beyond Fest the most only for one reason, and that is uh, it was a much larger theater. And it was packed, all kinds of standing room only at the back. And so it was a madhouse. And because I had only met Malcolm at the Austin premiere for the first time, there was a lot of nervousness there and also nervousness about the US premiere. And so Beyond Fest, I felt like I was able to enjoy it um, more as a life experience. And you know, obviously being a town that I've lived in for a long time. And uh, of course, Malcolm, there's videos on YouTube of the Q and A's. Uh, he's been incredibly generous. And Stephen Farber uh, did the Q and A after, and he was wonderful. Uh, and someone asked me today about Malcolm, and I was laughing just at the idea. It's, it's, he's not, I think, what most people would expect. He plays the villain so well that you just wouldn't expect him to be as, as sweet and generous as he is. Uh, you know, he's raised a bunch of wonderful kids. And you get why, you know, he's got that, that wonderful, that wonderful dad energy and, uh, so funny, so funny, so funny, but those will be stories for another day. We're trying to get through the year. Uh, yeah, he's hilarious. Here's some pictures. Gustavo Turner took this one. Uh, Yes, he's cracking me up there, and this is us. I think during the screening, we popped outside for this picture. Uh, and that's been wonderful. The audience reactions there, uh, actually at, at everything so far, has been really, really spectacular. And then we did some, I just, you know, again, grabbed a couple. There's a lot of comic people here tonight or that watch these. So I figured there's Mike Mignola and, of course, Bill Sienkiewicz. Uh, this was a little private press screening we did, and I, uh, because you can see from the size of this theater, we had uh, a lot of extra seats, so I invited some friends. So there's Bill Sienkiewicz again, and uh, and then there's Malcolm's son, Seamus, and uh, Malcolm with with Fred Malmberg. Fred. Uh, does a lot in a lot of industries. The thing that probably most people that are watching this would recognize is that he owns the Conan the Barbarian IP. Um, so if you're seeing the comics that are coming out, he's owned it for, I mean, 
I don't know, maybe 20 years, 20 years at this point. But he was the, the, my go-to for advice during this entire process. Um, the creative parts I felt really comfortable with, but the business parts I was really uh, not. And so just kind of explaining to me how the machine works. Um, he's produced a lot of movies and he was uh, absolutely a gift. And so it was really nice that at this show, so at this private screening, two things happened. One is that he saw that he's thanked very prominently in the credits. Uh, and then the other is that he got to meet Malcolm. And so that was super cool. But yeah, so thank you, Fred. There's so many people that, that I, if I started trying to thank everyone, we'd be here quite a long time. But uh, let me, let's see. Audio having short dropouts, I hope. We, I don't know. Uh, funny thing about time after time with Malcolm, they didn't know how to market it. They wound up doing a test screening and apparently something with like Jack the Ripper tested better in terms of just like marketing name recognition. And so instead of marketing it as like a time travel romance, they marketed it as like a Jack the Ripper film. Uh, and so it, it's one of those movies that has found its legs, but I just know uh, from Malcolm's friend Mike that it had a lot of problems when it came out because they just didn't market it correctly. But yeah, that's such a great, great, great movie. Um, and I've been, this is another, another side thing. I've been trying to get back through films of his that I missed. And if you haven't seen If, you have to see If. You have to see If. Um, but there's one Italian uh, May music or some Maggio Musicale or something that I can't find anywhere. So I'm, I'm thinking I got to find someone with a 16 millimeter or 35 millimeter print that'll scan it or something because it's not available on any physical media that I can find or any disc or anything. So any crazy Malcolm uh, friends or fa fans uh, or friends, please help me find that. I really want to see it. And of course, Oh Lucky Man and, um, and Caligula. Uh, and then the, another thing that we, we did this year, this is kind of a weird, you know, uh, middle and end in the sense of that this, the books will be here. This is a Kickstarter that we did. The books will be here in about two weeks, but with the holidays, <clears throat> with the holidays, there's no way we'll get them out properly. And so these are shipping right at the start of January. And the expanded hardcover of Beautiful Macabre, it's more than double the size in scale. The page count is about 20, 30% more pages. Um, we removed a lot of the more grotesque images and put in a lot more beautiful ones. Uh, and one thing that we really focused on to kind of do this final promotional push was we focused on The Sphinx Moth by Bernard Pancock. And I just love it. I love that drawing, the barbed wire, thorn, you know, the thorns crushing the heart. It's just such a great balance of that idea of, uh, you know, pain and ecstasy. And, uh, and so we made, again, kind of a fun Kickstarter thing. We, under, under normal circumstances, would not be making T-shirts and tote bags and metal pins. But this afforded us the ability to do that. What we do with these 
is that we just make them to order for the campaign. It's not a thing that we keep in stock. So they're, they're almost pretty much Kickstarter exclusives. So if you're ever looking at a campaign and you think you'd like something like the heart sigil or these moth shirts, they tend to not be things that we keep in stock. Uh, we just kind of do them and, and move on. We're not really a clothing business. You need to keep so many sizes and colors and all of that that it's just kind of easier to do it as a bulk order. And then we tend to order a few extra to round it up. And so oftentimes they'll be available for a really brief window, uh, but then not again. There's, you know, I don't even know if we have this one. No, you can't see it. I don't even know if we have these anymore but yeah that's one that i was super super proud of and th those will be shipping in january and then the other thing that we started is this jugendstil series and it's one that i'd thought about for a long time and uh, the it's it's such a um I don't want to say overlooked, but it's like, I remember there was a store called Fly By Night in Chicago. And there was a business card and it said Art Nouveau, Symbolist Art, Jugendstil, Secession. Like it listed every country and what they, Steel Liberty. And I remember at the time thinking, why not just say Art Nouveau? And it's because I didn't know. I didn't know. It's kind of like, saying rock and roll. When you really get into each country, um, nine times out of 10, if you show me an artwork, I can tell you what region that artist is from. It really is that different. But like with rock bands, there's times where you might play something and uh, say, oh, that sounds like the Beatles. And it turns out it's, you know, I don't know not some band trying to sound like the Beatles, but in terms of the, the way that the styles developed, um, you know, Dutch Art Nouveau, the Dutch had Javanese colonies. And so there's kind of a, a batik kind of element. There's this Javanese element that's really obvious in their work. And with Germany, so much of what they did was steeped in folk tales that when it started creeping into Art Nouveau, there's, there's way more of a fairy tale quality there that is like when you read stories about the way original fairy tales were, uh, kind of the darker versions. And it makes sense when you think about German children's books that are bizarre. Uh, it's all very kind of Edward Scissorhandsy, I think. Uh, and so this was just one of those things that I've had in my head and my heart for so long that we just had always talked about doing and I'm kind of trying to knock those things off the checklist um, that I want to see in the world. And so the idea then with Jugendstil is that we're, we're curating it very heavily. And the first volume has already been delivered. So if somebody kickstarted that, they already have it and are hopefully pleased with it. And the next one is on Kickstarter right now. It's on for another week. And the idea is that between these two books, um, it will cover all of the magazine illustrations from a periodical called Jugend, which is where all the Art Nouveau artists were converging. Um, and there's a lot in there that's not what a modern audience might consider Art Nouveau. Uh, and so they're, they're curated really heavily and uh, accompanied with artist biographies. And I'm trying to also get into the history of the founding of the Jugend magazine, which really put wind in the sails of the Art Nouveau movement in Germany. Um, and kind of just describing the way it unfolded. We are gonna stop at 1900. Jugend Magazine went on for decades, but 
everyone thinks of Art Nouveau as being 1900, but kind of like with rock music, once everybody in the world knows about it, it's kind of done. By 1900, we were seeing the seeds of really what is modernism, the Vienna Secession, that really futurist kind of climped geometry. Um, the Turin exhibition in Italy in 1902 that had the Charles Rennie Macintosh furniture and things like that really signified where the world was going. And it started to move into what most of us would call Art Deco. Um, although the American version of Art Deco is a little more often hodgepodgey than, than what you would see a few years earlier in Europe. Kind of in the way that Art Nouveau in America got very, it's almost like it collided with Victorian a little bit. American Art Deco is usually a little more, um, it's like it passed through an office where a bunch of ad agents were working. Uh, the purity that you see in Edgar Brandt and things like that, or you know what secession turned into um, is, is less common when people think of Art Deco in America. But that's a whole other conversation. Uh, but yeah, so Jugendstil is, uh, this is also gonna ship in January, but it's a book that's out right now, and this was just one of the pictures for one of the Kickstarters. This is the, the beautiful macabre hardcover, and uh, of course, Infernal Creatures, which we are, I believe, sold out of at this point. Um, and the Le Pater paperback, which if you don't have it, the expanded edition, the hardcover is so big that when we did it in paperback, I wanted it to be something that someone could read on a train or, you know, sitting comfortably in a chair and not needing, uh, you know, a pulley system in order to properly go through. And so we wound up putting in, I think, about 16 more pages or something. Uh, but it's got all of the check materials. It's got the... Uh, the, the version that was printed for the Czech market, which is a very sanitized version. Um, but so that is, uh, that is the joy of, uh, of what we've done this. Oh, sorry, Jugendstil will ship in March, I've been told. And then, uh, but it makes sense actually if everybody's, if we're dealing with the shipping for Beautiful Macabre, it's a lot of books and that will take the whole month. Um, but I think it'll go out in February. Uh, Infernal Creatures is sold out. Um, David says, yeah, it looks like if is available from Criterion. It's also available streaming. In America, we, and Chandra, you can take this away for now. Uh, and um, Americans didn't get exposed to Lindsay Anderson. Uh, but if you talk to someone from England, um, it just has a very different place. I just found out that, um, oh, lucky man, which is the movie that came right after If, same director starring Malcolm, uh, is, is Grant Morrison's favorite movie. Uh, and if you look at the poster for If with the grenade, it looks like the issue one cover for Invisibles. So definitely, uh, if psychedelic anarchy is your bag, uh, Lindsay Anderson and Malcolm McDowell converging is something you'll want to check out. Um, and then I guess, so David, uh, hello David, you wanted to hear about the history of Century Guild. The, the, so Century Guild started kind of as a brokerage. Uh, 
when I stopped working in the gallery world, there were collectors that would ask, do you know any buyers for this? And, and people that collected saying, can you find me this kind of thing? And so it, it kind of started there. And then when you get into um, that, you inevitably wind up kind of falling into some collections. And uh, then we started doing art shows and we were consigning pieces. Um, and so for the first couple of years, we were building an inventory, but you know, there's always people that, that want dealers to sell things for them. And, uh, and so then we were just operating out of my apartment in Chicago, selling primarily posters, but a lot of the Art Nouveau ceramics and pottery. And then uh, I had a painting of Gail Pataki's hanging and we had someone uh, from the Detroit Institute of Art coming to look at a piece of porcelain. And they said, yeah, 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 that's great. But who did that painting? Meaning the painting hanging above it. And it was Gail Pataki. And I'd been collecting her work uh, and she, you know, we were super close, uh, but I hadn't thought about selling her work. And that was really the first time that I thought maybe we should be integrating the contemporary art with the antique art. And so we started doing that and having Gail's paintings next to our Klimt lithographs and you know, Lautrec posters and Buka drawings. And then we opened up a gallery in Chicago. And that was the first physical space that we had. Before that, we just did pop-up things. We did uh, lots and lots of antique shows. We were just kind of road warriors where it goes in the van and you're driving around. But then, so the gallery in Chicago was the first one. Um, and then we started doing Comic-Con and San Diego Comic-Con was a huge, huge life change. We, I've told some of these stories before, so I, I won't get into all the, the anecdotes, but the, the broad stroke is just that Justin Dutta, who, who was the floor manager for the show, said, I think you have the wrong convention. And I was like, no, this is the origin of everything else in the room. And they were welcoming to us with open arms. We had a great show. And for years, I got to meet tons of my idols. And we were um, very well positioned. They always put us at the center intersection. And it was just such a joy to be with a community of people that really cared about the art. The challenge that I had a lot uh, with the antique business is you would get a lot of people that would listen to you talk about an artwork and they would be nodding their head the whole time. And maybe you're talking about, you know, some salon, poster for some important exhibition, anything. And you get to the end of this beautifully romantic story and they're like, wow, wow, that's great. And they're nodding their head. And then they say, do you have it in blue? And you realize like, oh my God, like they just weren't. I mean, that's kind of a bad example because maybe you could. I guess the point is like, it was clear that most people were just decorating. And just to kind of clarify that point, it's like if you tell someone, oh, there's only five copies of this in the world, and then they ask, yeah, do you have one that's two inches longer or something like that? And so with, with Comic-Con, with that community, um, our first customers were Bud Plant and Charlie Vess uh, asking about... Uh, I believe it was Heinrich Leffler and uh, um, 
you know, nobody at an antique show ever asked about that. They always ask about Mucha, Latrec, you know, the, the names you would expect. And so it was quite often uh, a pleasure that someone would come up and mention a really weird, obscure artist, and we would say, yeah, we do have something. Uh, and so that really changed our entire course. And because of that experience, we wound up moving the gallery to LA. And for a while we had galleries in both cities thinking we would go back and forth, but that was unsustainable. Um, and so my friend took over the Chicago gallery and we kind of set it up like a runway for him to you know, relaunch under his own thing and we just focused on California. Um, David, if we spoke at WonderCon, I hope I was nice. Sometimes I get very tired <laughs> at those shows. At the end of every San Diego, I would feel like I would need an IV drip. Like I'm, I feel like I would have talked to 100,000 people uh, at the end of those shows. And WonderCon was, was a little better, but still pretty relentless. Uh, but it was exciting and we're super, super grateful for it. And I wouldn't know all of these great creative people that I, I'm really honored to have as sounding boards for things if, uh, if it wasn't for those shows. Thank you, David, for saying it, it was nice. Um, you know, one of the first like big memories that I have, we had a big Art Nouveau room installation and I rounded the corner and sitting, there was room for four people to sit nestled in this beautiful carved wood uh, like cabaret lounge thing. And it was uh, Bud Plant, who if you don't know, is a bookseller that is just the best catalog of all time. And uh, Dave McKean. And uh, Charles, I'm trying a blank, I'm so tired, I'm so sorry. And Charles Vass and Dave Stevens. And so the inner uh, fan in me was just, you know, Dave Stevens came to the booth so many times that first weekend. Michael Kaluta said, thank you for being here. And, you know, he was one of the reasons I got interested in Art Nouveau. I saw his work when I was younger, fell in love with it. And then when I started seeing Art Nouveau, I was like, oh, there's more of this. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, it's impossible to not be a Dave McKean fan. And Dave Stevens, uh, you know, just one of the, definitely someone Muka would have approved of in his sensitivity of line, one of, one of the best comic artists ever. Um, and Charles Vess was another big entry point for me. Uh, his work was very reminiscent, obviously, of Arthur Rackham. But, you know, people like P. Craig Russell, all of these artists that, that really ingrained that sentimentality of line into my uh, young brain uh, were all people that by connecting at Comic-Con, it did two things. One is that it really reinforced the idea of the, the heart and spirit of the art beyond the commerce. Um, and then because we were in, in a room that was very tribal in its sensibilities. Um, you know, I remember Adam Hughes coming in the booth and hugging a big Mooka poster on the wall. And that was the excitement that I felt for the art. And I, you never got that at the international antique fairs. There was always tons of money in the room and people were, were decorating. Um, they looked at, at things as assets and they wanted things that their friends would know. And one of the cool things at Comic-Con is that people did not care if they'd ever heard of it before. Um, 
they would see it if they knew it was good, they trusted their taste and they loved it and they loved being turned on to new things the same, uh, same way that I feel about art. So that was really, really nourishing and is really directly why uh, I got into things like the filmmaking with Aurora and Caligula um, because it, um, you know, it definitely fueled that part of me immensely. Uh, we've actually stopped doing Comic-Con. It's really funny. I was telling, so I spent a lot of time with Bill Sienkiewicz, uh, last week and I just love him immensely. He's one of the n most wonderful people I've ever met and, uh, incredibly inspiring. Uh, he's inspiring enough as an artist, but as a human being, just, uh, just a reminder that generosity is the right way to be. He just, he's just so generous. Uh, and so I was telling him this. My friend Andrew Peepoy is a comic artist, and we grew up together. And as little kids, I had a comic book convention in my basement, and he reminded me a couple weeks ago that his comic book was my first artist management publishing endeavor. We took an art class together when we were like 12 years old. And he, we were going to do this little comic book convention in my garage. And he, we had to do a three-page book. And I told him, if you finish this into an eight-page book or whatever, I'll buy, whatever, 20 copies to sell. And so he finished it and went with his dad into his dad's office and they Xeroxed it and stapled it. And whatever it was, it was like a, you know, 25 cent comic that I got wholesale for 10 cents or whatever. And I was laughing. I'm like, I don't even know where I got the money. Uh, probably borrowed from my dad or something. But so yeah, Andrew Peepoy was my first uh, art move. But anyway. Andrew, when we first started doing Comic-Con, uh, was so crowded, so busy. And I said, this is great. And Andrew said to me, oh, it's not, it's no good anymore. I was like, no good? Like, look at these crowds. And he's like, yeah, but it used to be so much about the comics. And now it's just crowded with, with you know, all kinds of people that don't care about that stuff. And hilariously, I would say to him, you're out of your mind because there's so much money and bodies coming through that it fuels everything. And like we were on the cover of the art section of the San Diego paper one weekend and um, it's the attention was fantastic for us. We'll fast forward 10 years and I have to laugh, I'm saying the exact same words. It got to the point where you couldn't get tickets to get in they had to use a lottery system. The people that were our customers couldn't get in. If they could get in, they couldn't make it across the floor to us. Um, and I was saying the same things that Andrew did, I, that it just got, it, you know, we would get kind of choked out by lines for toy drops from Mattel. And, you know, the people like the... Mike Mignola's or Charlie Vess's or Mike Kaluta's couldn't get over to us. Uh, and the people who were our real customers would always call us every year and be like, do you think you can get us some passes? We can't get in. Um, and so after, I think we did 14 years at Comic-Con. It's weird to think about that. But after that, we stopped doing it. We did try to do WonderCon a couple times. Um, just because the people who put on San Diego Comic-Con are wonderful, wonderful. There's some weird thing going on with Larry Charest for Larry's comics where it's some fan expo or something. You got to kind of look online, but they've just kind of done him wrong. And there's all of these, you know, I've heard people complaining about lots of organizers that are more corporate. And the people that do San Diego Comic-Con also do WonderCon, and they just, they're just really wonderful people. They're wonderful people. It was such a joy to do that show. It was so difficult. It was so many moving parts. Um, 
I can't say enough wonderful things about them. So anyone having any frustrations with San Diego Comic-Con, it's not the people. The beast just got out of control. And so that's why we did WonderCon, is I just kind of wanted to see those people and wanted to interact. But um, being based now in Chicago, it's, it's hard to do. It was easier for us to do when we were still based in California. Um, but we haven't done any of that now for a couple of years. And a, a big part of that is, is why the publishing has gone so well. Uh, the thing that really clicked, I was standing talking to Grant Morrison in the gallery, and he was doing a lot with Magic Leap and some of these virtual reality companies. And he was telling me, you and I are going to be talking to each other, and I'm going to have a headset on, and you're going to have one, and I'm going to be in my castle in Scotland, and you're going to be here, but we'll be talking to each other like we're in this room. And in that minute, I just felt like a whale oil salesman in 1898. You know, electricity is here and you're still selling lamp oil. And so the big Mooka La Pater book was really the first salvo in me trying to say, how do I take what I think this gallery experience should be and put it in the hands of people in a way that's recreatable? Like, what's it like to, and that's the reason I use the big close-ups. That's the reason it's oversized. I wanted it to feel immersive. Um, and even with Caligula, like a lot of the hermeticism that's in there and a lot of the, you know, uh, you know, it's kind of like a, a, an unrateable version of the little prince, the way it lays out now. Um, you know, these are all things that I wanted the gallery to be bringing to the world as a sentimentality, uh, but you can only do so much in person and uh, works of art have that resonance that also moves along the path of the arrow of time. It's able to do it decades later. And uh, so, you know, I miss the era of Comic-Con. I miss the people, especially randomly getting to see uh, so many people that love the art the way that I do. But the next level, uh, if you're really, if the mission really is to be of service, the next level is, is the books and films and then it'll be music next year. But that's a whole other story. And David, again, uh, yeah, I liked WonderCon too because it was small. Even when we were doing Comic-Con, we did still do WonderCon. We never made money there, but it was just so much fun. It felt more like a vacation to me, whereas Comic-Con felt more like, uh, you know, a wagon train. Like, what's the Oregon Trail? <laughs> it was such a long week uh, and such a complicated setup and all of that. Um, but, yeah, they put on good shows, so... It'll be interesting with a lot of the studios backing out with a strike and things like that. I, I heard that the last year of uh, Comic-Con was, in many ways, the most interesting it had been for years for a lot of people. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if there's a chance of some of these things kind of recalibrating a little bit. I don't know. Uh, we have six minutes left. I'm a great rambler. I'm a really good rambler. <clears throat> just ask my son. Uh, it makes him crazy that I'll just keep talking. Um, but yeah, so, so Caligula was such a time investment that a lot of the publishing things and a lot of the music and film things were kind of on simmer with people working on things. It just really took my undivided attention for, for years, years at this point. But all's well that ends well. Uh, we'll be in theaters in 2024. Um, there will definitely be some events. Uh, I'm excited about, I'm not sure if I can say what's going on with the UK premiere, but it looks like something really spectacular 
is going to happen at the beginning of March in London. Um, and so all of that is really wonderful. Uh, and at that point, it's just kind of shouting it to the world. And then uh, we're stepping up a lot of our publishing schedule uh, just because there's a lot that we want to share. And so we'll be doing a lot of that uh, in the coming months. And there's some other creative things coming up, but that's another story. But the, uh, the most important thing, I think, out of all of it is that the reason that I do this and even doing these kind of salons is that, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to look in a book or look on a wall or, or have those experiences privately. Um, and it's very cliche to say it, but like I crave the community. I love the community and I feel like, uh, especially in a world of social media, so much of what everyone does is just like getting further and further into their boxes. And so I'm glad that we're going to be having lots of different public things in the year to come. I hope that I see people there. Um, I really want to figure out a system. I don't know if it's going to happen on Patreon or if it'll be here, but where we're able to be a little more interactive. Uh, I really love having a dozen people hanging out in a gallery. And, uh, you know, I know that a lot of people are really comfortable just talking at a camera. Uh, I'm not one of those people. I'm comfortable doing it, but I feel like... Um, you know, like I, I'm, I care very much who's here and who uh, wants to communicate. So, you know, we're still trying to figure that out. Any ideas are very, very welcome because I appreciate everyone so, so immensely. There is no Century Yield cookbook, Sean. We're not going to do it. Don't put that idea in Kat's head. Now she's going to hear this and see it. It's going to happen. Uh She's had a couple, I'll say that. Uh, I wonder what she's... No. <laughs> I believe that uh, both Chandra and Kat... Who is that? Who's typing? It came up twice. I wonder if both of you... Okay. When you comment, it does it on both Facebook and YouTube. I thought you... And Chandra were both commenting at the same time. That's cat commenting, Century Grilled. That's pretty terrible. That's a pretty bad cat. Uh, cat, are you going to do uh, another poster print? We also made these prints little so you didn't have to take up your walls in your house with big puns. They're meant to be kind of gift sized. So those are on the. Uh, the website. But Kat, are you going to do a poster with... Okay. So yes, she's going to do more with Doug. That's fantastic. She, David, she did a larger size for uh, the Beers de la Muse poster. And the thing that... <laughs> you're terrible. Uh, the thing that we figured... It, 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 she did it separately first. It did not go well. And the thing that I feel like we figured out is that it's a lot of space to devote towards something funny. Um, if it's something that you wanted, I'm sure she could make something uh, for you. So definitely don't be shy about writing in. Uh, I think she would just be happy to see that happen. I don't think it would be expensive. Um, but that's exciting. We're going to have more pun posters this year. Uh, David, what was your favorite one when you say that you would love a larger size? I'm curious which poster. I'll tell you, my favorite uh, is Mutropolis. That's my favorite. Uh, Beers de la Mars is, is pretty good. That one, I think, was our most popular. Uh, I love the Nosferatu on the T-shirt. Uh, we were going to do it as a silkscreen print. That's why we used that bold blue and that kind of neonish giallo red. 
uh, not giallo red, because giallo is yellow, but you know, that 70s uh, Italian poster kind of black, red, blue thing. Uh, but they're all different. They're all different, and uh, I like them for different reasons. But yeah, so David, you and I have similar taste. And we're at 9 o'clock. So thank you guys so much for being here. Um, I should mention the Patreon, which is just patreon.com slash Thomas Nagovin. We're uh, putting things up there that are more behind the scenes kind of stuff. Um, and then, of course, check out the uh, Jugendstil 2 Kickstarter. It's book two. Um, and uh, everybody's fantastic. I appreciate you guys so much. What a great year. Uh, I hope everyone has wonderful holidays, and I hope that you are surrounded by the least amount of craziness and the most amount of love, and that everybody uh, feels inspired to gear up and uh, get some things on their list for what they really want to tackle next year. Um, it's a, it's a great season. Thank you so much for being here, and we'll see you first Thursday in January. And as always, uh, message us and any ideas or anything about what we could do to make this more fun, please let us know. So thank you for being here. Happy holidays and happy new year, and we'll see you soon.